that we can all get on our faces, but I think if we can kneel or just do something in, in a position of surrender, we need to do it because the Lord's speaking to us. You need to take off your shoes because we're on holy ground. Let's do that. Let's just, I, I don't know exactly how to do this, but I just know we need to just worship the Lord in our, in, with our, our, our bodies, with our, in a position of it. Uh, just humility, supplication and humility. Lord, let heaven come. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Still our hearts, Father. Open the channels to receive this word. You know, when we uh, began to pray into this gathering, we really questioned whether we should have it on a weekend that interferes with, you know, Christian holiday like Easter, or Holy Day, I should say. And the Lord said no. We kept going back to this time because it's such a convergence of the Hebrew uh, Holy Days and the Christian Holy Days. And it seems like, you know, whenever you pick an appointed time, a set time, you begin to move into it and all of a sudden that thing hits the target and things crack and things expand. And even this week, we heard about the red moon that happened on the, yesterday and the, all this stuff broke open in Brussels. And it's just like we're in an appointed time, a set time of the Lord for uh, His purpose. And I pray that over the next few moments, things will be spoken that strike our hearts, that lights a fire in our hearts for the time and the purpose that we're here. Set times in the Lord, uh, of the Lord are spoken of in the scriptures. There's actually a Hebrew word meaning set time, moed. It's when um, uh, God came to Mo uh, Abraham and Sarah and said, but my covenant I will establish with you, with Isaac, um, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. See, set times are times of God's promised fulfillment. We talked about that tonight. There are also times of release of God's creative force and favor to separate the night and the day. The first mention of Moed is in Genesis 1.14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons for days and years. It separates the night light from the dark. You know, as we look over the face of the earth now, there's such a darkness, isn't there? But in this room, we're going to see something different, I believe. We're going to see a light dawning in the, in the, on the distance. And that's what my eyes are set on. And that's why we are all here. You've heard the sound, a different sound than what we hear in the news. There's a sound of a clamor of swords. There's a sound of a clamor of shields that are starting to connect. There's a sound of feet beginning to march. What's that sound? It's the sound of watchmen rising and saying, we will not relent. We're going to pick up these broken walls and we're going to start to build. Because this is the hour. This is a set time. Set times are most frequently used. You know what they are used for? Just what we talked about. The tabernacle of meeting. We are in a set time, a convergence of time, and a, and a purpose, and a place. Isn't that awesome? I just want to introduce Pastor Wendy from Convergence. We love you guys. Can we all just thank God for her opening these doors? Can you just raise your hand if you're from Convergence? Father, we just release a blessing yes, over those yes. from Convergence who have welcomed yes. us into this place for such a time as this. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that this would be such a powerful blessing to you. We know that because you have opened the tabernacle of meeting, God showed his sign. We are in a tabernacle. Guess what? 
God's presence is going to come and there's going to be blessings and things that you have longed for you're in a set time to see them come to pass. In Jesus' name, look at the prophetic uh, timeline out there and let's just believe God that this is an appointed time to see some of those things come to pass. And I believe that there are visions and purposes in your hearts that you have not seen come to pass. Something you've held for decades. Some of us. <laughs> that you've not seen it come to pass, but the Lord says, now is my set time. Ooh, something's shifting in this room. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Well, we're in a time of not only what we term as Easter, but Purim. So yesterday, as I was uh, thinking about the verse that we actually held for this gathering, which is out of um, Esther 4.14, yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We all focus, we love that, that verse, but the Lord took me to the few verses that, before that. I want to read them to you. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And then he goes on to say, Yet, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Ooh, that's a big responsibility, isn't it? Think of yourself in that place. You're a woman in a male-dominated environment, and Mordecai the, is coming to you and saying, are you going to take up the responsibility? And I was reading that, and I thought, I think there's a ring of this that I've read someplace else. So I went to Ezekiel 33, where God calls out the watchman. I want to read this. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make them their watchmen, when he sees a sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take the warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you... Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. What happened in Brussels? There was bloodshed on the land. What's going to happen next? We're all wondering, where's the next, where's the next attack going to happen? It's all over the news. People are using their heads going into this war. And yesterday, the cry came into my heart, where are the watchmen? The blood is being let. Where are the watchmen? On your tag is a, a little picture. It's a rendition of an open vision I had uh, in October of 2000. I was pressured uh, and in a pretty significant warfare. And I was just before the Lord, crying and begging and asking him, why, Lord, why? Why have we not stood in righteousness? Have we not, what, show me what I've done wrong, show me! And all of a sudden, he took me into this open vision. And it was a picture of the collapsed towers of uh, the World Trade Center. Out of the clear blue sky, a giant pair of hands came down, picked up the rubble, and opened it up. And Big Ben appeared. And, I, you know, it was an incredible shift in the atmosphere. God came in. His presence came in. 
And within three months, I was healed of the thing that I was struggling with. But the initial interpretation that I had was Athaliah is at the gates of our nation. There was a destructive force that was coming forth. I went and studied that scripture. And you know what saved the nation from the rule of Athaliah, who, where there's bloodshed all over the land? It was the watch. He set up the watch and I had big pens. A picture of a, oh, a watch, a big watch. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a picture of global time. So the initial interpretation was Athaliah is at the gate, set up the watch. You know, I was like a mouse in the corner. <laughs> Something's coming! Set up the watch! <laughs> and we did. I mean, we were actively involved within our region. But um, we weren't really prepared as a nation. 9-11 set a course in history. The world time changed. Everything changed. And so we are here 14 years later because we're at a set time for vision to come to pass. And over the years, that initial interpretation has changed and I've kept here in Global Watch. And I've spoken it out to people over you know, periods of times, but I didn't feel like I had relationships. Or, you know, I've been thinking, God, this is so presumptuous. But now it's different than even 10 years ago. We're suddenly thrust into a global war with this terrorism and everything's global now. It's time for the prayer movement to become global. And I've talked with key leaders and they're saying not only is this the time, but it's necessary, it's possible now. So we're at the very beginnings of this. And last year with a warning uh, towards America, we held the trumpet call west coast and i believe that was a real spiritual birthplace for the fourth watch being erected across the west coast and now you guys from the east coast central zone mountain zone have begun to hear the sound the trenches have been built so the first uh troops have begun to arise but laura with your word as I, we've begun to step out even with the west coast uh, trumpet call and uh, last july i said god is this possible and you know what he said? He said, there's generals in the field, they're waiting for their marching orders. This is not come, into my, come to my ministry, come to my event, this is an invitation of heaven. This is not about a launch, it's about a spiritual birth. It's about a call of heaven. And may it ignite your hearts with purpose and reason. So, before I go any further into the distinctives of what a watchman is and what a watch is to help give, cast vision for what we're about, I want to um, show a movie. We're going to go to the theaters. We'll have a little fun here. One picture is worth a thousand words, so bear with me. Do we have that ready? Can we shoot it? Wherever you hear the trumpet, 
Rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Yes. Nehemiah 4.19. A little bit blurbed, but that's it. There were different families. There were humans, there were hobbits, there were elves, there were um, dwarfs in that, that whole thing. The different, different families, there were different regions building their beacon. But when they heard the sound, they could rally. That's the picture of a watch. You know, we are in a state in our, in our nation where 70% of America is, um, is Christian. We're very fortunate. But where are we spiritually? We have our mat uh, wonderful prayer networks. We have uh, our days of prayer, and I'm not criticizing. But are we better today than we were five years ago? I'd have to question that. There is something that is necessary to put a stronger wedge that's consistent between the enemy's plans and God's plans for, for America. We can have our big gatherings, we can have wonderful gatherings, but unless we have a determined effort forward, we're, it, we cannot turn the battle at the gate. So I want to go into a, a, a little session on what is a watchman and what is a watch. A watch, as I just stated in scriptures, is extremely powerful to protect the purposes of God. With the walls broken in Jerusalem's time, they could not defend Jerusalem. We are in that kind of a place across the globe. The prayer, there's different prayer networks, but between the prayer networks, we are not connected. Prayer unites the church, but a watch unites prayer. We can operate in different families, different uh, theologies. We can operate together if we just join and determine to build together. Does, are you getting the picture? Those light beacons were in different places, different people were lighting them. But the battle was won because they were connected. They had a communication system that was uh, effective in sounding the alarm. Okay, so what's the distinctive of a watchman that sets us apart? You know, I hear people, I'm a watchman, I'm a watchman. Yeah, well, we were all called to watch. Every person, every Christian is called by Jesus to watch. I mean, he told it 20 times in scriptures. Do you think we could get it? Watch. And even to his closest disciples, just before he was going to go to the die, literally go through one of the worst scourges in history, he said, will you not tear me? Would you not watch with me one hour? Ah. Could we just get it in our hearts of the meaning of what it means to watch? So I want to go through precept upon precept, seven steps of a watchman. The first step is that they seek the Lord uh, in all things. Psalm 27, 4 to 6. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head will what? Be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. We have come here to seek him. And those, it's promised in scriptures that if we seek him, we will find him. Amen. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, was dealing with a situation and um, it, it gave me no rest. I, I was up all night wrestling with God over the issue. It seemed like if I put one uh, step to the right or one step to the left, I'd slide down a slippery slope. There's just no way my head could deal with it. Do you think my head could get rid of it? No. I wrestled the next day into it. And then finally I got kind of a tinge of, you know, I'll just put an inquiry out. And I sent off a little email in my little office and I went out to the kitchen. You know what happened? big pop and the earth started to shake and I thought like we had this big 4.8 earthquake and it, I saw the pool out there rocking and reeling I'm, I'm, 
Oh God, forgive me, I put it in my hands. Oh God, I was down on my face. The earthquake was not for me, please don't. But the timing was, was for me. And I, I said, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me. And I went immediately to Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord. Feed on his faithfulness. Commit your way to him, and you will see it to pass. And I said, Father, I repent. I am so sorry. And do you know what happened? The next day, I got a, a message that totally blew me past all the obstacles I was seeing. They seek the Lord in all things. Yes, we fail, but God is so good. Our, our job is to continue seeking him and be willing to admit when we fail. <laughs> so, honestly, when we seek Him, then what happens? We desire to serve the Lord in all things. Deuteronomy 10.12 What does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? I pray that this scripture begins to release a healing on what Laura talked about tonight. For those who have been battling in the secret place, feeling like you're all alone, like the things you're seeing are never going to come to pass, I want to relieve you of the grief, of the disappointment, of the discouragement, because God has heard. Seek to serve Him. I believe that now is the time for the global watch. I'm speaking that in faith. It's not presumptuous, it's necessary because the battle has become global. We need to know each other on the wall. I know that as we've been walking this out and meeting people like you in the, across the nation and into the nations, my prayers are completely different. They go deeper because I know the people. That's the reality of a watchman. Do you think the Rohirrim knew what uh, the uh, Hobbit was, where the Hobbit was coming from? Yeah, they knew. They were connected, and they were ready to go to battle. And that's what's rising up. I look across this room, and there are generals in this room. You're receiving the scroll. You're picking it up and think, this is the time, this is the hour that we will lock shields, we will lock Amen. swords, because the times dictate it. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Well, all I'm saying is serving the Lord and walking in those very difficult places, being sidelined when you have a big burden, you have a big vision in your belly, nobody's listening to you. It's hard. But the Lord says, no, not, it's not my time. Because I'm going to show you some things in the trenches that you need to see. See, if, I, if we had started this 14 years ago, it would. But now, having been in the trenches and seeing a few things and living life, things are a little bit different. And I believe that he's giving us more wisdom in how to connect and how to build in ways that bring life and can bring the root systems together. It's God's timing. So we seek the Lord, we serve the Lord, and we sit at his feet. We're able to discipline ourselves amongst all the, the, the warfare and all the dismay that is around us. We can learn to get our mind, soul, and body under the presence of the Lord. Psalm 136, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. You know, the rest of God is not going <laughs> to bed and kind of being lazy through life. The true rest of the Lord takes a lot of energy. I went out of the rest of the Lord in that story that I told you. I was in anxiety and frustration and concern. The rest of the Lord says, I, you know what, I am going to trust him in this situation. I just release it under your feet. You're the Father. You are faithful. I'm going to feed on that faithfulness and know that you have the answer. Noah, the word, the name Noah, is actually the root word of Menuach in uh, Hebrew. That Menuach means rest. 
And in the time of turbulence of Noah, where God was so mad with the world, he's ready to destroy every living creature, he looked down on earth and zoomed right into Noah. There is a man that knows the breast of God. In the tumult of these days, God is looking for watchmen who will stand their watch. Yeah, we will we'll trip up, but we're going to hold each other up. And there's a man I can trust. And on these watchmen, I can build a vessel upon which I can pour my spirit. And the harvest shall come if we will take the responsibility like Esther did and say, I will stand because I see a nation in danger and I will take my responsibility to hold up the purposes of God. That's the rest of God in the midst of turbulence. Seek, serve, sit at his feet. What happens then? We become seers. We're able to discern the times. We become sons of Issachar who could understand the times and the seasons. I personally, I'm going to try to keep my personal opinions out. I personally fear for the body of Christ that in the end, even the elect will be deceived. But there's hope. If the watchman will take our stance, it's a powerful, protective stance, and it doesn't take many. It takes a remnant that's committed. 2,000 knights turn back. Three attempts of Islam to come into uh, Europe. The Knights of St. John. Over a period of a number of about 40 years. About 2,000 people in Bangor, Ireland, decided to commit to pray in 555 AD. And they especially noted the night watch. <coughs> And it created a well of prayer that lasted well over 200 years and prepared missionaries for when the Dark Ages came over Europe. What I'm talking about is a construct that is going to go beyond our years. I'm not talking about a ministry. I'm talking about a call of God. There's a lot weighing in the balance right now. And I believe that in this room there's DNA, spiritual DNA that's igniting tonight, saying, God, I'll pick up the scroll. I'm ready. I'll take up the marching orders. I'll do what I can to build the camp. So they become seers, and they can uh, rejoice when Jesus rejoices. They weep when Jesus weeps, but they also see. And they have the strategies of heaven to make it happen. So when they see, they can sound the alarm with accuracy. Ezekiel 3.17 Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them a warning from me. In the times of Nehemiah, now it happened when Senbalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites, how many nations are that? heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry and all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Did they succeed? Yeah. Five what? Nations coming against them and these, all, the, all these little families in Jerusalem like, they're like the little hobbits with these big giants around, but they, you know what? God was with them because what? They took up the responsibility. And they decided to do it. So they sound the alarm and they sound it with accuracy. They also, because they've been with the Lord, they stay in the rest of the Lord. They're not thrown in trouble. Uh, trampled around by the, the winds and the, uh, the seas, the waves of the seas, they are strategic. 
in what they do. They, God gives them strategies to defend and to um, both be defensive and offensive in protecting what they have been given to do. In uh, August 7th, 1942, <clears throat> a man by the name of Paul Mason picked up his radio, radio in uh, Bougainville Island in the South Pacific. And he went up to a perch on that little island with his island coast watchers and observed 20,000 Marines landing on uh, um, Lunga Point in Tulagi. This is in the South Pacific Islands. Small little islands, but highly strategic and one of the toughest battles of World War II over these small little islands. But it was the Coast Watchers whom God sent to place in strategic places that warned people. And a famous, when he watched the and, and Marines coming into land, he could also see bombers coming in from the, the Japanese ports. <coughs> And he sent out a very famous message, 24 torpedo bombers headed yours to the American troops. It gave them enough time to secure the, uh, the troops and put themselves into a defensive position. None of those bombers returned that day. And a second wave hit them the same day. By the end of the day, Japanese had lost 30 of the 51 planes sent. My father was in one of those, it was in that company. His life was saved, I believe. But through the course of the war, Coast Watchers rescued 75 prisoners of war, 321 downed Allied airmen, 280 sailors, 190 missionaries, hundreds of native people, and in one remarkable rescue of a destroyed PT poet saved John F. Kennedy, a future president of the United States. Don't tell me that watchmen aren't effective in the body of Christ. Don't tell me that watchmen can't change the course of history. It doesn't take many, but it takes the committed. And those who will build and, and, and connect with one another. So, last but not least, and this is the ultimate call of the watchmen, I believe, is that they are strong builders. And that's the mature stance of a watchman. See, I believe that since 9-11, there has been an escalation of the, the call to people to worship and pray. Houses of prayer, groups of prayer, uh, whatever prayer watches have raised up all over the earth. I mean, there, it's countless how many are happening. But now the move is to how do we connect? There are many that have awakened. There are many that have uh, risen to build. Their, their, their entity, their community. But now the question is, can they look beyond that community, that ministry stream, and build with others? And there's a sound in their words, there's a sound in their hearts, like you can almost feel it. There's a sink that begins to happen. There's not the resistance, there's not the question, there's not the fear, oh, you're going to take over my ministry. No, I'm telling you, there is a whole different mindset that needs to develop as we begin this watch. And you have heard the sound. It's in your hearts. And it's time for the beginning of this building of these beacons so that we can be more effective in how we uh, relate, communicate in this time that we, um, in this time of difficulty in our, in our nations. We're in a strategic time for our nation. You know, this is the 240 year anniversary of Paul Reaver's ride. We are in that time period up until April 18th. What Paul Reaver's ride did was set into motion a whole new communication system for the nation, and it set the nation into a place of victory for the revolutionary war that would follow. We're in the 240 year anniversary of an appeal to heaven flight being placed over our nation's first navy. And those little schooners, you know what the first thing they did? They captured a whole brigade from uh, uh, Britain. And on that brigade was enough um, ammunition that it would have taken them over a year to make. 
They did three more captures of that, of similar schooners, and it set the course for victory for America. It doesn't take many. It takes the committed, who will know that what God has said, and we trust in Him in all ways, and He will bring it to pass. This year is the 240 anniversary, 240 year anniversary of our Declaration of Independence. This blows my mind. 56 men signed, some, signed a document against the largest empire in the world. Get a figure on that. Less than 25% of the colonists even agreed with the Revolutionary War. 10% fought it. Wow. Yeah, wow. It takes a remnant, a committed. So what are the distinctives of a watch that separates us, say, from our little, <clears throat> our ministries or ministry streams? There are powerful people out there, powerful ministry streams. Stay connected with them. But the issue is, will we connect? It's so easy. The watch doesn't interfere with established ministry streams. We want to honor them in every way. We want to honor convergence and their vision. But they can part still participate in the watch. And you know what? I have a feeling that when ministry streams and churches begin to build like this, it's really going to help them. Yeah. It's going to defend them and give them peace and bring in the provisions of God. Did, did that not bring the provision of God to win a war eventually? Right. Yep. Amen. So what are the distinctives of a watch compared to, say, our ministry? There are three things that I want to say. One is its community. You know, people talk about, you know, what is your, your prayer, you know, mandate, whatever, oh, it's nations, or, or it's, it's uh, our city, or our, um, our state. But you know what's really starting to grab our hearts now is it's about community. What's your prayer community? What's your relational infrastructure? Community is everything. We used to do large gatherings um, and brought in, they were powerful. Angie, you were part of those. And, you know, the call to prayer in Bakersfield in 1998 um, was, Lou Engel was launched basically from that. And um, there were a lot of the gatherings, there were healings that happened. It was just very, very powerful. And then 2006, after a very wonderful time, Fred and I went back home and we looked at each other and it's like, where's the lasting and sustaining force here? And um, we were literally heard a knock on the door, our front door, and we went to open the door and there was nobody there. And we looked down the street, it was completely silent. And then we both heard a voice speak to us and he said, there's no vessel that can contain my glory. So we stopped doing that, and that was the training ground for what I'm talking about now. And we went underneath and began to develop relationships by relationship. And um, some of you are here because of that. So community is everything. Building a strength of relationship. I mean, there are people in here that they, I would go to battle for. I would not relent until something would come to pass to bring a breakthrough. You'll see that kind of resolve. I'd love to see that resolve in, the, in what we're beginning to establish with these watches. That we will not relent. When something happens to somebody on the East Coast, we will not relent until that's resolved. And you can begin to see a protective force begin to come into our lives and into our nation. Community is everything. The other thing that's a part of it is commitment. It's, we are at war, guys. A loose army is not going to happen. You know, we're talking about ISIS taking over uh, these places in Iraq. <clears throat> ISIS is everywhere. This battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of the dark ages and spiritual uh, hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. This cannot be fought by flesh and blood, guys. We need a watch to get up on the wall and begin to deal with these issues. 
And I keep hearing people say, well, this is going to be, this is an end time battle. So why do we do this anyway? It's, it's, God's going to do it. Hey, you know what? He's coming back for a ready and alert bride. That's on fire. Who wants to get married to somebody that doesn't have any passion? He, the ten virgins, they were all asleep when he comes. But five of them have oil in their lamps. I want oil in our lamps. In America, you know what? We're in the 450-year anniversary of one of the first martyrs on American soil, Jean Rabault, October 12, 1565. We're in that anniversary year. 450 years. When, when, Lord, cries the blood of the martyrs, when, when will you redeem us? It's now. You know what Psalm 136, or 132 says? I'm having it here before the Lord as I'm speaking because I'm saying, God, God, redeem it. You know what Psalm 132 says? Before Jean Rabault was impaled, he said, Lord, this song, he spoke this by heart. One of the people that was with him escaped and was uh, able to get back to France, so we've got the report. It says, it opens by saying, Lord, remember David. He said, he's looking at, an, at a sword coming into him. He said, Lord, remember Jean. Lord, remember me. Verse four, or verse three. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place to the mighty one of Jacob. We are calling for the fourth watch. We will not give slumber to our eyes or go to the comfort of our bed until we see a dwelling place for the Lord. There is a harvest coming on America. The beginning of the awakening is happening now because God is awakening his people because he's looking over his word to form it. America, what's up? I am going to come to you in the night watches. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Respond to me. Yeah. Amen. Be like Samuel. It's a Samuel call. Lord, why am I waking up at 3 o'clock? Come on, I need to go back to sleep. Oh, worry about my sleep. I'm not getting sleep. Why don't we be like Samuel says, what is it, Lord, for you call me? Now, all of you, many of you are in this room. This is happening. I was just in Australia with some of the coast watchers <laughs> calling for their spiritual DNA to rise up. Do you know how many in the audience rose up? When I asked them, how many of you, this is before I even talked about the, the power of the fourth watch. You're all familiar with the fourth watch, right? In here. Two thirds of them stood, but they've been waking up from three to six a.m. I said, wake up! This is the beginnings of the awakening. I am convinced of it. And it's in the secret places. You know what? And Luke 12 talks about when does the thief come in? He comes in at night. We've underestimated, both Fred and I, we've been carrying this burden for 14 years. We've underestimated the warfare on this. But for such time as this, people are hearing. This is the hour. I'm convinced this is the time the gates have opened. It's a time where the breaker has gone before us. And we are going to go in after him. The invite has come to pull us up into the place of God. Community, commitment, and last but not least, in order to have community, we've got to have com communication. If a trumpet blows, we need to be able to hear where it's coming from. We can't be a watchman alone. Sorry, it doesn't work. I bless you that you feel like you're a watchman, great. But it's time to grow up and really build and connect. And we, we're going to pray into the other time zones. I'm believing that God's going to raise up 70 watchmen for time zones. 70, uh, 70. 10 per day. Come on, that's pretty deep. And we're going to be able to uh, replicate. We're going to be able to pass it on to the next generation. 
and we're going to be able to begin, and we, when we have to get off, others are going to be able to come on, and we're going to be press in and put that wedge in between the enemy's plan and God's plan for our nation. God is not done with America yet because he has not yet performed a full word of this. That's where my faith is. My faith is not on the darkness around us. My faith is where the light I am seeing, light, lights, lights begin to rise up over the nation and into the nations. And beams are beginning to be lit so we can connect and we can hear from one another. And the heartbeat of God is going to be in the prayers. It's not going to be empty information. Empty information drives me up like a prune. But if you send me something about Egypt, I'm on it because I have friends in Egypt. I know how to pray a little bit better. The passion and the love in my heart is a bit bigger. That's the value of community, of commitment, and communication. You know, the, the, the people with the beacons, they were... Miles, 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 miles apart. But because they knew each other, they were going to go to fight. Mm -hmm. Amen? Good. Yeah. Good. Are we getting the picture? Good, yeah. I want to take us into a, just a closure here. <clears throat> and we want to go into a time of communion because we're going to set our hearts. We are not here for just an event. We're here for meeting with God. There's an awakening happening. And the invite is to you. Tomorrow is about strategy. I'm calling out the general in you. I'm calling out that gifting that has been silenced. Some of you feel like the seed has fallen into the ground and has died. But unless seed falls to the ground and dies, how can it live? There's a sound I hear very clearly of the clanking of the shields coming together and the swords beginning to work. It's not only for our nation, but it's into the nations. See, that's what happened in a little village, no-name village. I think God likes little no-name villages, <laughs> little no-name places. Here in Hutt, Germany, 1727, a very deeply divided community <clears throat> decided they would begin to kind of try to work together. And they determined, and they, they signed actually um, a covenant of brotherly affection in May of 1727. And they decided to work it out. God gave them a few months. Let's see if you're going to really huh, work this out. You know what was in that covenant? They, they had to commit. The elders had to commit to, to meet every other week. And if you missed two meetings, you were kind of dealt with. There was a discipline behind that. And I, I'm just speaking to you as a prayer movement, <clears throat> people of prayer. There is an element of commitment that is very powerful in prayer. When our youngest son was born 20, 23 years ago, God convicted us of our prayerlessness. That was when Larry Lee's uh, book, Could You Not Tarry One Hour, came out. And we were really, it's a powerful book. We were really committed. We committed to an hour a day. And I was just a new mom with two other active boys, and I, you know, that's a lot. But we committed. And we stayed true to that. And now it's just not one hour a day, it's just a relationship ongoing friendship with God. But if we had not taken that commitment, we would not be where we are today. And nobody could take that away from me. Our youngest son, you know, some of you know the story. Was, um, <clears throat> he's a great kid. He's a wonderful kid, but lazy. Uh, he grew lazier and lazier <laughs> and lazier. I mean, oh. I have some stories to tell you. You can talk to me in private. Every wrinkle I have is well earned. <laughs> and I tried every book. I mean, I read every parenting book, and I tried them all. It didn't work. I mean, we're at the point where he's a student at Berkeley. He's a very gifted guy. And um, 
he stopped through Berkeley, and somehow, I don't know how he passed, but we were ready to kick him out. We'd go on the streets. You know, you, figure, you can figure your life out now. We've given you everything we know to do. I've tried everything, and I'm, I'm tired of getting old and gray. And about his end of his sophomore year, we connected him with a friend of ours who was a Navy SEAL. And something began to shift. He began to, he's a swimmer, so he started swimming the bay. And he started working out with the Navy SEALs while he was finishing his college degree. In fact, it was that Navy SEAL said, you better finish that college degree before you even think about the military. So, okay, okay. I'll start studying a little bit. <laughs> anyway, he somehow finished. And September 11th, he graduated boot camp, and he's now in phase two of uh, Navy SEAL training. But what I've seen is a res resurrection power come from commitment and a little bit of discipline. The call to the watchman, I want to just release the sense that there's a new commitment coming upon us. Something's shifting in the atmosphere. I feel like just a sense of a lightning, of a lightning that's giving new life to dry bones. You know what the first step to getting out of the dry bones is that? God, I, this is, it's like going to the spiritual workout gym. Go to the gym first. Oh. Second time, this is getting a little bit better. You get through two weeks of it, and all of a sudden, I'm going to get there every day. This feels really, really good. A step of discipline will really help that commitment. That's what happened in, in Hernut. The last, poured, God came down and poured out his spirit because he saw that that, that well of revival wasn't just a little emotional high and good time with the Lord. It was an outpouring of, like the Pentecost. It lasted over 150 years. It's still a well of prayer today. So my exhortation to us is that we're here for a time with the Lord Maybe if we could have some background music tonight. <clears throat> We're going to commission us for the weekend right now. We're going to start ourselves with a, a communion. Jesus' command was to go to uh, love God and to love one another. His commission was to go and make disciples of all nations but his call was to watch. Would we take this Esther moment? Would we take this es Esther moment and um, if you could just turn that down a little bit. If we could take this time as an Esther moment to say, I will take on that responsibility. Gina, could we have some background music? <coughs> When we go into this, uh, Fred, do you want to come on up? When we go into this time of um, communion, we're not going to only just take communion, we're going to anoint you. Joel 2 talks about sending us grain, new wine, and oil. Those three things appear in Scripture fairly frequently, but I love what Joel says. You know what happens when we take the communion tonight and prepare ourselves to take up the responsibility? He will remove far from you the northern army. He will open pastures that will bear fruit. The fig tree and the vine will uh, uh, yield their strength. He will give you the former rain and the latter rain. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat. The vats shall overflow with wine and new oil. He will restore to us the years the locusts have eaten. For those who have been in the battlegrounds, the time is now. Marching orders are being released. The invitation 
being released. The call of the watchman is real. It's no longer come to my ministry or be a part of this ministry. This is a call of heaven. It's not about a launch or a mobilization. It's a spiritual birth. And the question is, who will feed my baby? So I'm preparing to come for a ready and alert bride. So close your eyes. Just come before the Lord. Remove the veil, Father. Any doubt or unbelief. That as we come to this communion table, this is an invitation of heaven to commune with you. And through the night seasons, Father, we ask for visitations. For the love anointing of heaven to come upon these precious ones. That we remove every barrier that will keep us from your presence. To prepare us to hear the scroll of heaven. Strategies that can unify, that can help us align and cause your army to advance. May the shields and the swords be placed in these hands and wielded in righteousness and truth, with clarity and with understanding. Fred's going to uh, lead us into some communion here. But we're going to invite you, start with this group over here, to go and uh, get your piece of bread and dip it in the wine and carry it back with you. And we're going to hold it in place. We'll all take it together. But as you leave, we're going to anoint you as well to close out the night and prepare us for tomorrow. come up and then they're going to get anointed as they, as they come up. Okay, so why don't in this section over here, why don't people just stand up and just line up and, uh, and you're going to, again, you're going to take the bread, you're going to dip it in the wine and then you're going to come back you're going to hold it and come back so we can take it all together.
so the folks in the middle section, if you guys want to get up.
Lord God, for this, this holy time because we're sitting and we're standing on holy ground. And as Sue uh, spoke this evening about commitment, as we take, commun take communion this evening, Lord God, we are, we are recommitting our lives to you. And we, we just thank you for giving up your body and shedding your blood for us, Lord God. And, uh, in Matthew 26, it says, While we're eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks. And he broke that bread. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take it, eat it. This is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and offered to them, saying, Drink, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Please partake in Jesus' holy name. corporate anointing that was going on and um, and and we're just gonna we're just gonna continue to move in that uh, uh, tomorrow and um, and and give plenty of time for the Lord to speak through uh, through his people so thank you for all for your participation in that. we have a schedule and um, I'd like to pass this out to each one of you if you are uh, husband and wife or if you came with a group of two or three just take one for the group or one for the pair Otherwise, we'll run out of these things. So it's for Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah, the schedule says 8 o'clock tomorrow. It's 10 o'clock now. We're going to shift it up to 8.30. Can we have a little bit of worship? Start right at 8.30. We're going to start on time. We're going to have that discipline um, being on time. And uh, tomorrow, again, is about strategy. And... Um, I just pray that the vision that was cast tonight would percolate through our hearts for strategy. And again, this is not about developing something that's going to be a momentary ministry. It's about establishing something that can last beyond our years. So Father, I pray that these are the seasons of the great harvest that what you poured out in Heron Hut so many years ago 
can now, if we take these concepts and begin to understand them and implement them, Father, that you can begin the foundations for a great harvest to come and for the raising up of a ready and alert bride. Jesus' mighty name. So at 8.30, uh, we'll start worship. We're going to have a start, start, uh, a short session on basic constructs, and then we're, most of the morning we're going to spend in discussion groups. There's five main discussion groups, and a Hispanic group, and Otilia and Sam Curiel have started a Hispanic watch, so if you are interested in them, in that, can you stand up? They're, they're here, they're precious, precious pastors from Bakersfield, wonderful people. There's going to be a group on communication, one on uh, Developing administration and growth, uh, how to how to develop the depth in the watch and also the expansion of the growth. It's a big group. And one on discipleship with Fred, uh, another on collaboration with Jenny, and a I'm missing one on vision and uh, mission. Without vision, people perish. Habakkuk two says, "Write the vision, make it plain, that they may run with it who read it." It's really, really important what's being cast tonight is vision. And I pray that the fire, if there's any fire in your spiritual DNA, that you allow God to breathe on it through the night season. So, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, come. We're in a holy moment. The invite of heaven is here. May we take what has been released, Father, and hold it into our hearts for the revelation in the morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gina. Love you. We love you guys. Tell somebody you love them. Isn't God great?